It's my 3D printed Lowrider 2 CNC part three. And this time we're making some stuff. This is part three in my Lowrider 2 build from V1 Engineering. It's a variation on the MP CNC or mostly printed CNC. In essence, that's what it is. A CNC machine with mostly 3D printed parts. Previously, I printed the parts and put it all together, and I also configured some custom firmware. And in this episode, I set up the router and a spoil board and finally cut some stuff. As usual, I'm gonna cover everything step by step, so let's make a start. When we left off last time, we had our machine operating, but it didn't have anything in place to do any cutting. The instructions recommend a DW660 DeWalt cutout tool but my main goal is to use this machine with a laser cutter. So in the meantime, I'm gonna use what I already have, and that's this little cordless Ryobi trimmer router. However, I would not recommend this. Despite me having many, many batteries, cordless is definitely problematic. On longer and harder cuts, it becomes a game of chicken, constantly checking the power, and when I think it was getting too low, hitting the pause button, waiting for the buffer to complete so it lift up 10 millimeters, and then changing the battery. For quick timber jobs, this was okay, but for anything longer, it was perilous. As the battery runs down, the motor loses power, and if it stops completely, you're going to snap your cutter. So I don't recommend cordless, but either way, here's how to kit a different router to that recommended. You can see in its default configuration that my router just didn't fit. There was nothing to mount up with the holes, and even when I removed the lower case, revealing some nice mounting holes, the spacing of the mounting holes was unfortunately different to the default on the Lowrider 2. Therefore, I needed an efficient solution. So here we are in CAD and I'm using Onshape. I quickly modeled the end of my router and I thought about making some sort of adapter, but I think it's just gonna be easier to remake this part with these mounting hole spacing. So I'm gonna be a bit cheeky and make a copy of this so I don't lose the original. And then I'm gonna create two sketches, one to extrude and fill in these holes Okay, there's the old holes removed. Time to do another sketch to match the new trimmer router dimensions and then cut those through. Done, that should now match up exactly. So I'll head to the garage and cut it out. Fortunately, the plywood piece that I bought to make this was large enough to have plenty left over and I was easily able to get out my additional piece to suit my custom router. I noticed the original Ryobi mounting plate had countersunk holes, so to get mine to fit perfectly, I needed to add them as well. On the underside of the new piece, I got a drill and a countersink bit, and I carefully added a chamfer on the four mounting holes. One of the nice things about this router is you can completely remove the clear cover, and that makes tool changes really straightforward. My measurements were correct and all of the holes lined up, so I used the original bolts to mount the Ryobi clear housing to my new custom timber part. More good news, and perhaps lucky because I didn't measure this, but the vacuum chamber didn't fail on it either. It took me about 10 minutes to unbolt the old one and bottle my new custom piece, but finally my router was mounted. This was a really satisfying feeling to finally have the router in place and to be able to cut something. After turning it off and on, just to verify that everything was sound, it was time to move on to the next problem, and that was mounting stock to the bed. All of the CNC routers I'd used thus far had some slot extrusion on the bed, and then they use little clamps to mount your stock so it couldn't slide around and come loose. Problem is that my machine is on top of a work table and I'm not looking to add anything that heavy or bulky to it. The solution most people choose is a spoil board and the coated particle board used for kitchen cabinets is cheap, large and easy to source. Another thing you'll need to find are some screw in threaded inserts and it's really important to make sure they're not as thick as the board you're screwing them into. Here's a quick and dirty version of how they work. You drill a hole just big enough for them to fit into, you screw them in, their outer teeth lock into the timber, and now we have a sturdy metal thread to secure things in place to the timber. This fastening system, along with some printed clamps, is gonna be the basis of holding our workpiece down to the table safely. I found an old piece of 20 millimeter board in my garage, and I went to the hardware store to buy all of the fittings they had in stock. 
Next up, I used a ruler and a sharpie to draw a 100mm grid, although other common sizes are 96mm. You could actually program the machine to do this, but I chose to do it by hand, which only took about 5 minutes. The bore size for me was 7mm, which I verified from my test piece. After drilling, we flipped the board over, and then we used that same countersinking bit to make a little bit of clearance for the fittings on the underside. Again, there's a lot of holes, but this really only takes around 5 minutes. My garage piece was pretty mangy, so I decided to peel off the backing from the underside. My final job was to screw in the fittings. I used to drill with a hex attachment to get them most of the way in, and then I finished them by hand with a hex key. I found that if I did them too tight, they actually broke, so take care that you don't over torque them and end up with something that's impossible to remove. If you've done this correctly, they'll sit just beneath the surface, which means when you flip it back over to go on your desk, the whole thing sits really flat. Here it is flipped back over, and you can see I have a little bit of a gap from the top surface to where the threaded insert starts, and that's really important, because we don't ever want our cutter to collide with them. As for the clamps, there's plenty of free designs online. I printed a set of these scaled up two times, but these ones, longer and slimmer with a long slot instead of a hole, were much more useful. They need to be printed with 5 perimeters and really high infill because they've got to be mega strong. The idea is to use bolts that match your threaded fittings to clamp down your stock onto the board so it can't slide around and get ruined mid-cut. These short ones do do the job, but they sit up a little bit high. Therefore, these long ones are much more low profile when you position them correctly. Most people would screw their spoil board to their machine. For me, that wasn't an option, so I clamped one end. You just need to make sure it's not lifting up on the opposite side. So the machine is ready to cut something, so that's exactly what we're going to do. I'm going to show you how to set up three different types of cut jobs using the free cam software Kirimoto. We'll check out results as we go along. I'm sorry, but I just lied. Before we do that, we need to go through a pre-cut routine. And if you don't follow a routine like this, it's easy to miss a step and have the machine scoot off to the wrong bit, damage your workpiece, or even worse, injure yourself. We'll come back to creating the G-code after this, so let's move on to the next item, which is safety. Sharp router bits and flying debris are a given, so make sure you wear some safety glasses. Also protect your ears from the loud noise. One thing you might not think about is the dust you're breathing in, so please get a nice shop vacuum that's designed to be used with this kit. I was pleasantly surprised on timber at least how good a job this thing did. A very important step to start is to retract your cutter so it's not hanging below the gantry. You need this out of the way before the next step, which is homing or squaring the machine. In my last video, I showed you how to set up dual end stop self squaring firmware, shown here self leveling the Z axis. My spool board just fits underneath when the machine is homed, so that's a big win. Next up, we're going to secure our stock or workpiece. If you can grab it with your hand, give it a big wiggle and it doesn't move, it's probably going to be strong enough. It's also important to make sure your clamps won't be hit by your moving cutter. Next, we'll move the cutter into position, and I start by lifting it up 30 mils or so, and then lowering down the router, which is now clear and not going to hit. Then we use the menu on our controller to move it into position, hovering it just above the zero position we set in our cam software. In Kirimoto, we have no choice but to set this to the very center of what we're cutting. You can use big movements at first, but then utilize finer increments to very carefully lower down into position. You're generally aiming for the cutter to be just touching the top of the stock. This next step seems simple, but is one of the most important. We need to zero all of our axes. If you forget this, the machine is going to try and go back to the home position before it starts cutting, and that's not going to be lined up at all. We can now turn on our vacuum cleaner, as well as our router, and double checking everything else has been done, it's time to start the job from the LCD. Trust me, if you forget any of these steps, there's a fair chance you're going to snap your cutter or ruin your workpiece. But if you get it right, it's very satisfying to see the machine start and form your creation. Now we can go back and look at generating the G-code. Over in Kirimoto, we want to do some one-off setup work by setting up our machine. With the mode on CNC milling, we want to click Devices, Plus, and then name our machine. I measured my bed width to be an excellent 500mm and my depth to be an even better 1000mm or 1m. Beyond that, we want origin, center and top ticked. Everything else can say as you see it on the screen and our file extension is going to be G-code for our Marlin firmware. We can save and close this and then come back and add in a tool. We'll hit the plus to create a new one, give it a name, normally something that makes sense to you. 
Tool number is unimportant, but for me, I'm going to tick metric and then enter my flute diameter and length. The flute is the top spiraling bit that actually does the cutting. The diameter should be on the packet and you can measure everything else if need be. The shaft isn't actually that important here, but we'll put it in just to be thorough. Once again, we'll click save. One limitation of Kirimoto is we can only import 3D geometry such as STLs. Tinkercad, however, will take SVG files. You can either import that or use a free online converter to turn something like a DXF into a compatible SVG. Then after that, you can use something free like Tinkercad to bring in your SVG. You can then set your desired thickness and then export an STL ready for Kirimoto. There's three types of cuts we're going to cover. Engraving something on the surface, cutting something out completely as a profile from a sheet of material, and engraving a 2D image in 3D on the surface, just like a lithophane in 3D printing. We're gonna start with our engraving, and I'm doing the very simplest of Hollow World with TT created in Tinkercad. We're ready to import our STL by simply dragging it onto the screen. And the only finishing technique we need is waterline instead of something else like Linear X. Now we can go to Slice and it'll give you a preview of the toolpath. We have a problem in that it's trying to cut out the outside of the block. For internals only, we need to click Pocket Only. Now when we re-slice, we'll get a preview and it's no longer trying to cut out the whole piece and will limit itself to just the engraving. You can then click the preview button to see the final toolpath. And in Kirimoto, the origin of the job is always in the top middle. Finally, we can click export, name, and download our G-code. And here it is on the machine. After going through the checklist from earlier, it started cutting, and it started cutting really well. Two things to note here. The vacuum cleaner is doing a pretty good job of collecting 90% of the sawdust, and also that the clamps that I started with sit very high and are close to touching the bottom of the gantry. Hence my switch to the red ones later on. When the job is finished, we need to manually turn off our router and then use the LCD to go to the move menu, lift up the gantry out of the way and move it backwards clear of the part. It's also a good idea to retract your cutter as soon as you can. We can then unclamp the workpiece from the table and inspect our engraving to find it looks exactly like it should. Big success. It's now time to cut out a profile and what better test than cutting out a lowrider 2 part. If we retain our previous settings but click slice, we can see only the inside is being cut out like when we engraved. If we unclick pocket only and then come back to slice, we can see that our complete shape is now being outlined and therefore cut out. However, if we come to preview and then drag the preview slider down the bottom, we'll see that each vertical layer is being cut at the same time. To fix this, we're gonna come back down to the settings and click depth first. Now when we re-slice and re-preview, we'll see that it's fixed and that each individual hole will be cut down vertically one at a time, which ensures the profile can be cut out safely. Here it is again, cutting on the low rider, and once again, on timber, it works perfectly as we would expect. Each part of the outline goes down three millimeters at a time and completes before moving to the next, just as we programmed. When the job is finished, we move the router out of the way, and then we can lift up our part and see that it cut out perfectly. Chalk up another win for the Lowrider 2 3D printed CNC. We can also see that when we cut a profile the whole way through, the reason for the spoil board, and it does get spoiled. I would recommend scraping off debris and vacuuming it up to leave a flat surface for future cutting jobs. I then thought I'd apply this process to a sheet of 3mm acrylic, and the machine has no trouble cutting through, although the vacuum does struggle to pick up the heavier debris compared to the timber sawdust. This was a 5 minute design I whipped up and was perfect for validating this functionality. Next up, some 3mm aluminium sheet, and this was much much harder on the router, so I had to run the gauntlet of watching the battery and changing them over frequently. This was highly compromised because I was using woodworking bits and I also wasn't using any lubrication. The nail in the coffin however, was the cordless router. Once the battery got low, it would get bogged down, lose RPM and then I'd have skip steps and a failed cut. Before this point however, the machine was definitely rigid enough to be able to machine the alloy. With a better router, optimization of feeds and speeds and adding coolant, this will definitely work. The machine is rigid enough to make the cuts, it's just my lack of experience and my equipment that's letting it down. RIP to my snapped 3mm end mill. 
Okay, so how about a 3D relief like the one you're seeing here from my other CNC router? You're going to start by finding an image that you like, whether you create it yourself or get it off the internet. You can then use your favorite lithophane creating software. This one is linked in the description. And when you import it in, you'll have an STL to download, which then goes into Kirimoto. For these, we need to untick waterline and then tick either linear X or linear Y. When we slice, we can see that it zigzags back and forth across the surface, cutting out our 3D shape. So how did it turn out? Well, remember that I'm using a cordless router. I exhausted all of my batteries and it only got about 30% of the way through. It was working however, you can make out the neck and the lower half of the jaw. This will work with a corded router. One thing I haven't covered in this video are feeds and speeds, and it's going to vary depending on your bit and your material. As well as the beginner's guide found on the V1 engineering website, there's plenty of free online charts and calculators where you can put in your parameters and have some values to start with. I had comments in the last video saying this machine wasn't going to be rigid enough and it was basically a waste of time. But hopefully this video, as well as the other results on the internet, show that this machine is capable and can do a good job. Just make sure you don't use a wireless router like me. Now my plans all along were to actually use this with a laser instead of a router. So you can expect a video on that in the near future, as well as a further video on how to modify this thing so I can quickly unclamp it from the table for easy storage. If you've got any thoughts or comments on how that should be done, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy CNC routing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.